Hello and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. The usual big shout out must go to the wonderful TJ Flute Company for their sponsorship and support for our Talking Flutes pods. You can find them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Facebook at Trevor James Flutes and on the web at tjflutes.com. Catriona Ryan is a wonderful musician and flute player with a passion for orchestral performance. She's principal flute of the National Symphony Orchestra based in Dublin and despite her busy orchestral life, relishes the opportunities to engage in chamber music, recitals, concerto appearances, masterclasses, teaching, coaching, recording sessions and guest principal flute invitations. Catriona has hosted regular pre-concert talks for the National Symphony Orchestra season concerts, most recently acting as a presenter for live stream broadcasts for the National Symphony Orchestra on RTE culture. A couple of weeks ago, I disturbed this busy lady one afternoon to discuss flute playing. So, ladies and gentlemen of the Talking Flutes podcast verse, may I say, and I need to get this right, she's already given me the pronunciation, Kayad Millefelcher, or Fulcher, or a thousand welcomes in my pidgin Gaelic to the fabulous Catriona Ryan. Hello, welcome. Hello, I can't really Fulcher on your Kayad Millefelcher. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to I'm gonna have to be really truthful here. We've actually been doing this podcast for the last 15 minutes and I forgot to turn the switch the machine on, <laughs> which is just... You've missed it all. <laughs> they've missed so much, haven't they? They've missed a bit, quite a lot out about me, which you've managed to turn Aww. the tables and interview me. Yes, I wanted to turn the tables and interview Jean-Paul for a while because he was saying, oh, I've heard, he's heard me doing pre-concert talk for the orchestra. I work with the National Symphony Orchestra here in Dublin. And he was saying, oh, you're really good at it. And I was like, I'd really love to turn the tables. People would really like to hear your about your life and hear you answering questions. And I know they hear you talking about the flute all the time, but I mean a bit more personal. So people, if you'd like that, just let John Paul know. Send in a message. Well, the one, the one person, <laughs> I would, the one person on, in this world who I'd let interview me is you. Oh, why me? <laughs> but thank you. No, oh, I mean. it's, well, it's because I've actually watched your regular pre-concert talks for the National Symphony Orchestra, and you are, you're just such a good interviewer because you give the person you're interviewing space to answer and you're engaged with them. And the hard part is you have the question in your head or pre-prepared, if not, if you're sort of in your brain's going in different directions. And then depending on how they answer it, your engagement has to move with it. And you're so good at that. You're so good at capturing the essence of what they said and then asking the follow-up question, which pertains. Which trying, yeah. trying to flip it over into the question you actually wanted to ask. Yes. <laughs> really difficult and it's so distracting when they go a completely different direction and it's fascinating and you know the audience wants to hear it so probably if you do let someone talk it's because your your brain is wired they're going how do I turn this back to what I want to say and you're, you're listening at the same time it's really it's complicated I don't know how you do it but um yeah it's really interesting I hope to do more of it yeah are the worst ones when you may say worse who are the best better ones to interview are they musicians or are they conductors well, I tend to do, if I'm doing pre-concert talks, it's always with whoever will do it. So, you know, contractually, they have an obligation, but it's always right before the concert. So it's not ideal for any of mm. us, to be honest. And usually the conductor and soloist do it, but sometimes you have a bit of a, a diva or a divo and they, they won't, or they're too, they're too in, you know, they're very method yeah. <laughs> in their prep and for the concerto. So they don't want to. Um, so it can vary, but it's usually conductor, at least, and a soloist, usually one of both. And um, who's easy? It depends on it depends on their level of ego, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Some people are just fantastic at talking, and you know that you just have to give them little pointers, and they'll be off. And they're the easiest, I suppose, aren't they? Because the time goes by, and the audience is happy, and and you're just, you know, you have a couple of maybe main bullet points that you want to get to about the pro of the concert, the program, and if they don't, you know, take the bait and talk about what you'd like them to talk to, then as long as they're interesting and the audience is happy, that's actually all that matters, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Do you find you, even though you probably want to talk about the the music and the piece and whatever it, the, the concert program itself, that often it comes back to talking about them. 
Hmm. Well, yes, particularly with conductors, I find, but, but not always. <laughs> not always. Yeah, usually. Uh, soloists can be so interesting because they've got such a different approach yeah. to what they're doing. And, and you know, pianists, are, we, we, we have a lot of piano soloists. They live such an isolated life, you know. So actually, some of them are really difficult because mm. they're they're not brilliant at talking. And some of them are just so delighted to be in a room with other people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, Woo-hoo. And always with musicians, you'll have those who have a really intellectual approach to what they're doing. And they have very much uh, researched and they're talking about the historical background to what they're performing. And that's kind of true with conductors, too. But I think I think conductors sometimes can be a bit more like you say, they talk about themselves, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially for an audience. They they want to see the people behind the music. They're going to experience the music, hopefully, and enjoy it. So for them, I always think the free concert talk is about making it personal, making it more human. You know, our poor elitist classical world, we're so, I think it's so much better than it used to be. But, you know, it was sort of up on a pedestal and, you know, people would feel it wasn't for them to come into a concert hall, which still upsets me. I had a neighbour across the road say to me last week that they, NSO that I play with, some of our concerts have been going out on TV here, Irish TV, on Sunday mornings at the crack of dawn when nobody will see them. But um, <laughs> but you'd be amazed how many people see them. And, you know, he's, he's a truck driver. He lives across the road and he's a truck driver. And he said, oh, I saw you on TV. And um, he said, I wouldn't really normally like that kind of thing. But he said, actually, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, but uh, I really, really enjoyed it. You know, I really like it. It's brilliant. He would never go to a concert. You know, he would never buy a ticket and go. And I was just saying the same thing to him. It makes me really sad that people feel like they're not allowed to go into a concert or it's not for them or they know they won't enjoy it when they've never even tried, you know. So it's a bit the same. I like the fact that pre-concert talk makes us human. And that's the biggest thing with being a musician because we're all different human beings. And as musicians, you're, the way you play and the way you perform come over very differently to the next person. There is no two performances that are ever alike of the same piece, even though the dots are a mathematical equation. I, I think so too, but it's amazing how you have to try and convince people of that. <laughs> they think that you're just, when they hear what you do, they think you're just doing the same thing every every week. And what do you do for a living? You know, <laughs> you, know I, you just play Beethoven 5 every week and, and you know, maybe track 4 or something. But uh, yeah, but I do, it amazes me how difficult it is to convince people of that a conductor will have an impact on how we play a piece and they might want you to breathe in different places, they might different volume, different balance, different players sometimes, you know, depending on who's out sick or on leave. It's never the same two days in a row, sometimes even the same piece. <laughs> so that's what I love about what I do. I just love that. And I, I just sometimes wonder, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is I wonder if it's because we think we analyse it quite deeply, you know, and maybe somebody listening to it doesn't analyze it to the same level, of course. And that's why we find it so interesting because we hear the difference from literally from day to day. I don't know about you, but I lift the flute up some days and I think, how could I sound this bad when I've been playing this thing for 40 odd years? You know, how can I not be making a better sound today? And then the next day will be absolutely fine. But yeah, but that's because we're analyzing it. I mean, it probably sounds the same to someone who doesn't know much about flutes. So in your orchestra, you happen to have an oh, absolutely brilliant flute player who is your conductor, Jaime Marta. Yeah. How for does, my yeah, how <laughs> does that work? I mean, does he have a bias to what's really hard? I mean, obviously Simon Rattle, I think if I remember rightly, he was a percussionist, wasn't he? I should know that, shouldn't I? And I don't. Nor do <laughs> I. I nor do I. It's just something in the back of my head saying perhaps he's a percussionist, but a lot of them are obviously pianists and things. But Jaime mm. was just such a, is such a just a brilliant flute player. When you're playing a piece that has prominent flute parts, is he very particular? Do you know? It's good you asked me this question now because had you asked me six months ago, I might have had a different answer. But we've we did darkness with him fairly recently and. In the same program, Ravel Scheherazade, which has this beautiful movement, the magic flute. So sort of, you know, okay, the magic flute is a massive solo, but it's a solo coupled with Daphnis. And I've had Daphnis and Lapry Midi in the same program before as well. So this didn't feel too bad. This felt quite pleasant. But I was, I was, you know, I was totally psyched up. I was getting mentally prepared for weeks ahead of time. And that was over at Christmas because it was in late January. I was really, I had myself steeled, you know, that he was going to be really tough on me. He was going to have a distinct interpretation in his head. And if I didn't do exactly what he heard in his head... He, I would get such a grilling and um, he would be really hard on me. And honestly, the reality couldn't be further from that. He was so great. I actually, 
went down to the conductor's room after the concert to thank him, which I never do, because he was so lovely. He was really, like, when I was playing, he was smiling at me and really encouraging. And, you know, he was chatting with me afterwards and he was kind of saying, you're loving this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of said, well, in a, in a slightly masochistic way, yes, I'm enjoying myself, but uh, it is mildly terrifying doing it with you. But, but he, I think part of him was still misses playing at times like that. You know, you could see it in his eyes when he was looking at you and you were playing the solo. You could see... Um, not jealousy, but sort of envy uh, yeah. in a way. But I think you might not see an ordinary repertoire in more standard repertoire. He might be a little bit tougher on the flutes, not intentionally or just because, he's, you know, he has this very high standard in his head that he's expecting and he has a very specific sound or interpretation, you know, like any flute player would if they were conducting. It just doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but I have to say, no, he was completely lovely for Daphnis. You know, I actually enjoyed playing it with him conducting, which is a feat really, isn't it? So yeah, I, it was really a pleasure doing it with him. And he's a, such an emotional man and emotional flute player. Does that come over with his direction of the orchestra? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes not all the positive emotions, but yeah, it does. Absolutely. And especially I think to the audience. Uh, on concert nights you know he's really good at chat he's brilliant for pre-concert talks for example I've done a couple with him and he's just you just say a word and off he goes <laughs> and he talks and talks and talks and the audience love him and he's very ordinary with the audience you know again going back to the being human thing he's just really excellent at that it's, it's not he's not putting it on it's just he's just very good at being open and saying saying the right things and adding a bit of personal story or something to his intro and the last we were doing what were we doing with him recently Oh, Lord, I've forgotten. Isn't that terrible? And he was saying he took his son to hear it. And he was describing how his son reacted to hearing this piece for the first time. And the audience loved that, you know. It just made it, gave it a different perspective. And he, he played the little, little intros. We do little intros and things. And then we play a piece on, on a concert night, which is great, you know, because the symphony orchestra, the symphony hall, concert hall can be a bit, you know, duck shirt, all that. It can be. So it's nice to break down the barriers a bit. I think he's really good at that. Well, setting a narrative to the audience, that just completely knocks down any barrier that you have, doesn't it? Because then people are engaged with what's coming up. Yeah, and especially people who come all the time, you know, it's great for them because they, they know the faces and, and they get to find out a little bit of people's personalities or their what they're contributing to the concert other than just playing. I think it's like a little reward for people who come every week. And it's really nice to see increasingly since COVID, actually, we've seen more younger people and bringing their kids. Oh, wow. Which I just love. Yeah, I just love that. Because I'm a little bit like for you over there in the UK, maybe music education could be a little bit better in schools here. Yeah. You know? And I think you've always traditionally had a much better practical side to it, where people were, were given instruments or they might learn get free lessons in school on an instrument. I know it wasn't across the board, but it was still there and wasn't necessarily true here to the same extent at all. So it's really nice to see kids coming in because you know what I'd love to see what their unbiased, uninfluenced perception of an orchestra is or a concert is. And if they think it's boring, fine. And if they think it's stuffy, fine. But I like the fact that they get to make their, their own minds, you know? Do you know, that'd be a really interesting experiment, wouldn't it, to bring in a lot of underprivileged kids from, you know, deprived areas, bust them all in and just say, just for one 30-minute segment, just sit and listen. Yeah. Because it, it wouldn't be 100% like, oh, you know, that wasn't that wasn't my vibe or whatever it is they would say nowadays. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Nor would I know. They have a different language to kids nowadays, don't they? Yeah, they do completely. But yeah, it's true. I mean, I know there are, here there are quite a few violin programmes of a very, very successful one here in Dublin in a less privileged part of the city. It's probably mixed now in terms of people live there um, from all kinds of economic backgrounds, but it's really successful. So every kid was given a little fiddle, you know, every kid in the school, I think. And then they set up an adults orchestra for their parents. And it's... It's really strong. And they sometimes come to concerts, you see them coming and, yeah. Do you know, that works. Kind of it's like a, a, it's in a parallel cycle, isn't it? You've got the young ones and you've got the parents and encouraging yeah. them both to do it at the same time. Yeah, like the lady who set that up is called um, Joanna Crooks. I think she's a doctor. I'm not sure if she's a doctor, but let's call her Dr. Joanna Crooks. And she she was incredible. She um, ran the National Youth Orchestra here, the then Irish Youth Orchestra, I think it was called, before she took it over for, I think, 10, 12 years. And she was completely amazing. 
um, and had it really, really thriving. And I happen to know she didn't take a penny for doing it for the whole time she did it. Wow. So we need more people like her in the world. But she set up this, this other string school as well when she left the youth orchestra. So she's done very good things for the world in terms of music and youth. Yeah. Do you think it's just because like the I think when people hear music in the back background of films, in essence, it's still classical music. You know, if you're talking at big feature films, it's classical music. It's just written differently, not in the shape of a symphony. But it's still, it's symphonic music in a film format. So a lot of people can sit there and just be emotionally moved by that type of music. Because take that music away, take that music away in E.T., you would not be be crying when Elliot leaves. No. Not Elliot, the the little creature thing, (laughs) E.T. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When he leaves. We got it. (laughs) You would not be crying there. You would not be crying on On Golden uh, Golden Pond and in Nimrod in the Dunkirk film when that was played at sort of half speed. It sort of gets to you and you just think everybody has access to it but they're not necessarily aware they're listening to classical music. They're not necessarily aware they're listening to symphonic music just scored slightly differently. Yeah, and they're not biased against it in that context. Yeah. You know, they're happy to the event. And like this time of year, the Yorks, we've just finished our season last Friday. Um, I'm not sure when you're putting this out. Is it going out live? I'm not really sure. No, it's not live. It's going out in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so this time of year, the repertoire can change quite a bit for a symphony orchestra. I'm sure it's the same everywhere. And we have several movies live to soundtrack. We're doing Spectre, you know, Bond, and we're doing... What else are we doing? Are we doing a lot of Harry Potter? We're not actually doing that with a movie. What's the other one we're doing? But you're Superman. Yeah, Superman. So they'll be crammed. We were doing two performances of each because they're so popular, you know. So you're playing the same score that was notated for the music? Yeah, as far as I know. Yeah, we've done a few Harry Potters. My God, they're fiendish. The flute part yeah, is so they- I can't imagine I've done movie soundtracks and played on recordings for movies and I'm really glad it wasn't on Harry Potter. (laughs) 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 They're cued off to those flutes. They sound fabulous. So perhaps the access to classical music is there in the form, in the shape of film or TV series where there's music in the background or whatever. It's just perhaps we need to educate youngsters to tell them you're actually aware of it. It's part of your life. It's sort of pigeonholed in a certain different area, but would you like to know more? Because you can still have your love of that they have R and B, hip hop, rap, whatever it is. You can still have your love for that. Without classical, you will not have the emotion that film brings. I know it, it kind of is. Is it just me? I kind of feel like there's such a an almost anti classical feeling yeah. brewing, isn't there? It's such a loss. I mean, I can I can understand the arguments. I can understand the arguments, but they're blown out of proportion completely. And um, what I would I like, like you were saying that, yeah, I would just love kids to come to concert, come to a concert. And it doesn't necessarily have to be kid specific. You know, we do kid specific concerts and they always enjoy them. But sometimes I, I feel like it can be an element of a show about it. While they have a great time and I love playing them, the applause, is, I think I've talked to you about this before, the sound of a, an auditorium full of kids is just applauding. It's just gorgeous. It's like this tiny little high pitch clap. But yeah, I just, I wish there was some way to get them in to hear like a, a symphony. You know, a bit like, like a project like you were talking about. I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure it's been done. Where you actually have them in and sit through a whole symphony and then ask them, how did that feel? What did you think of that? Was that awful? Was that great? You know, I don't know, but how else can we know how kids naturally perceive classical music without being told they're not supposed to like it, you know? Or without being told an orchestra's boring? Because when they come to an orchestral concert, it's largely auditory for them. There's visual because they're seeing the conductor and they're seeing the musicians. But with social media and everything being on the screen, a lot of them are very visual nowadays. Vis- the visual mm. acuity is sort of the paramount yeah. thing. So matching for them, if the primary focus is auditory in an orchestral concert, how do you get it so that their primary sort of sense is in line with the auditory? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I think we have such competition now. I know traditionally maybe back in you know, Boston Pops and stuff, we used to do full proper concerts for kids. I used <laughs> but, to love um, them. I love Boston Pops. Yeah, was, uh... I know. But I, I think in more recent years, we've been so worried about trying to get the kids in and, mm. and fill, fulfill education remit and all that kind of stuff that we've sort of forgotten. We, we, we change ourselves so much to accommodate them, which I don't mind doing and I think it's a great thing to do. But I think we should also have some element of content where it's just literally what we do. I do think it would be really important. Maybe kids could have a different perception of, you know, everything is so instant now. And everything, like you say, is so visual and so entertaining. And 
they have to have a complete wow factor. I, I teach kids. I teach two groups of beginners. And it's not at all in a highfalutin school at all. It's just kids. And I love it. But it's been really challenging since COVID. Two groups of five, total beginners, and then five, year two and three. And they recently had, their school of music have a big annual showcase in a big concert hall in Dublin. And it's very prestigious and, you know, quite intimidating. You know, there's an auditorium full of people. And they're up at the front of the stage because it's a, they're playing in a band on the front of the stage. And um, I was <laughs> I was up in the audience listening to the concert and my little beginners came out and I told I told them, you know, how to hold their flutes when they're not playing and all that stuff. But oh my God, I did not think, I've never ever experienced this before. So I don't know if it's because they went through the pandemic and they were at home for so long. But they were completely not phased by the fact that there was a full auditorium of people looking at them. And I've never, ever come across that before. In all the other years, they were chatting to each other and looking over their heads. I was so embarrassed. As their teacher, I was thinking, oh my God, this is my fault. I should have grilled them, but it didn't occur to me. I'd never had to. In previous years, everyone always just sat there with perfect attention. And it just made me realize that, A, I need to adapt the way I teach them. And B that age group so they're sort of nine ish nine ten they have a different sense of what is intimidating you know and maybe we could use that with kids who are slightly younger than them mm-hmm. and bring them into something that is supposedly intimidating and difficult and while they can have everything else be really instant and really quick this could be the one thing in their lives or one of the few things in their life that they actually sit And it just let it happen to them, you know, in a good way. And um, I think there's maybe potential there, that kind of area of things, the mindfulness or something, you know, that it's a sort of a a quiet time and they can sort of assess how they're feeling while they're listening, how they're feeling about themselves and their life. If that's not too um, self-aware for kids, maybe it is. I'm not sure. But Breaking down those attitudes that uh, sort of Mm -hmm. society seems to now... Uh, give them at a very young age and I and I think it's probably yeah. a good thing to be sort of self-aware and self-confident it does sort of bind you into certain thinking patterns at a young age it does and I, and I think while while before we, there used to be great education set up and they'd be having music in school and they'd be playing there isn't maybe that to the same extent in a lot of schools now so it would be up to musicians and music groups and orchestras to to let the kids have these experiences you know Otherwise, they won't be open to them. They won't hear an orchestra. They won't know it's an orchestra on the movie. They won't know what an orchestra is. All that stuff. I'm I'm, I'm jumping to the horror area, but yeah. So over in the UK, um, they they the kids are obviously a target because it's the future generation. It is what is coming ahead, and we need classical musicians within these young little kid kiddies to come through to be the orchestral orchestras of the year. But that's kids. Is enough done cross culturally? So in other words, uh, say, for example, certainly in your lovely country, you took a lot of Ukrainian refugees in when the war started really early on. In fact, you opened your your doors before anybody else opened their doors. Is enough done to to welcome, to bring those into the classical music field, to bring in the the Asian majority in, in, in certain countries where there's different musical tastes and different musical styles, but to show them or welcome them into the world of classical, Western classical music? No, there's <laughs> a simple answer to that. I think, no, there isn't enough done. I'm not sure there has been any, any efforts to, I know we've had... Um, a bass player come and play with the orchestra is Ukrainian. Um, but as far as I'm aware that he's the only musician who's ended up being able to work with us who's come over here. No, I, I, we should be going to where they are and playing for them. And and I, I'm i sure some musicians are, but I yeah. know the orchestra, I know it's difficult to move the orchestra. We're a big unwieldy elephant of a thing, but but I'm not aware of, of any orchestras having done that. And it, it would be a great idea. It would be. Hopefully people are, the Ukrainians are, are finding something akin to a home at this point, but I know there's difficulty. I know we're running out of space mm, and yeah. they're probably in horrific places and conditions and um, not necessarily conditions, but you know, it's probably far from the homes they left, put it that way. And it might be nice to cheer them up. Yeah. But in this beautiful world where we are multicultural and we go to London and there is, there isn't a defined culture because we've welcomed everybody in and that's the way it should be. In fact, I think there's more of an Irish culture there than there is a British culture because it's just, just, you know, on Paddy's Day, it's I think London's just taken over, <laughs> like the rest of the world anyway. Kids are important, but 
I think potentially, when you look at classical music, we are guilty of it being very much a sort of a middle middle class to upper class. Yeah. And yet there is so many others. I, it, I may be wrong wrong there and the people may be actively doing it. But when Bollywood started really hitting the UK, well, the world probably, but hitting the UK, suddenly we all get really into that groove. And that's really Bollywood coming to us via TV and via TV shows and dancers. Well, we know we need to have two things. We need to have orchestras, equivalent groups, choirs more visible on TV. Yeah. First of all, and we also need to have that, what we were talking about earlier, that any school, no matter what background, I think it's getting better now, but uh, certainly 30 years ago, even the people who were professional at that point had all been lucky enough to have parents who would pay for them to have lessons when they yeah. were kids, you know, and that that is the difficulty. So if like the program I was talking about earlier with the violins, if we had a similar thing in schools everywhere, then yes, of course, there'd be much more diversity in music and you'd see much more diversity in orchestras because traditionally it has been it has been from, you know, more well well off backgrounds. Uh, and also, yeah, let's face it, it's sort of the the cultural thing. There might have been a certain amount, oh, I want my daughter to play the piano and yes. I want my son to play the violin because it's a good thing to do. It doesn't matter whether he hates it or not. <laughs> but um, it'll look good in his CV later on when he's applying to go to Oxford or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. There, there, must, there would be a certain amount of that, I'm sure. But that wasn't my experience. And it's changing. But, yeah. It's changing. You look in orchestras. And the great yeah. thing about orchestras is if you go back probably 10 years ago, even a short period of 10 years ago, you would struggle to find many women. Yeah. Although my orchestra, I have to say, has always been really good in that regard. We had a female leader, you know, in, in the 60s. Gosh, uh, amazing. Really? I know. In fact, there are probably too many women in my orchestra. <laughs> I'm sure some of the men would agree. But yeah, <laughs> no, definitely gender wise, it's a it's a good balance in, in our orchestra. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it used to be uh, unusual. In fact, I remember I was driving home from my workshop this morning thinking, what am I going to be talking about with Jean-Paul? And look at what we're talking about. <laughs> I couldn't have imagined this at all. And we know that should be de rigueur in every walk of life. And yeah. whilst the world world is changing, it's not changing quick enough. But I think I mean I would speak speaking to the wonderful late Tara Bentoven about the struggles she had. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful player, but the doors were completely shut. Yeah. Tara yeah. Would, would try and break down the doors. And if well, if you're not gonna bloody help me, then you know, I'm gonna do something different. And yeah. she did it a very different way. She was incredible. That podcast was amazing. I just absolutely loved it. And her honesty, again, I was thinking this morning, how can how can I go to pod talk talk to Jean Paul after her? I mean, that's just up there, the epitome, the the best conversation podcast conversation i've ever heard she gave the podcast yeah. everybody a couple of days before she died she knew she was dying yeah. um, mm. and she gave that it was her last wish she gave that uh, to uh, a podcast to claire and I'll, yeah. I'll put the link beneath it beneath this podcast but it is the most ear-opening yeah. w- without sentimentality honest. and it was honest yeah. she so she, honest. she wanted to say some things that she hadn't been able to say before I loved what she said. I loved what she said about flute playing. And I was thinking, I hope I wouldn't have fallen into the category. <laughs> what does she call it? Alternative yeah. flute playing. But that's what I think playing in an orchestra is all about. And, you know, as she was saying, I think she said to Claire, Claire was sort of was saying something along the lines. And she was saying, oh, I'm so relieved to hear someone say that. You know, we're, she was talking about blend, uh, yeah. blending the sound in an orchestra. And that's completely the way I think about playing in an orchestra. It's it's not, I, I don't see myself as a flute player almost. You know, I don't. I'm. You have to be a chameleon. You're just a chameleon in there. Mm-hmm. And you, you change colour depending on what you have to do. And I couldn't agree with her more. You know, I think it was true when I was in college, which is not today nor yesterday, but it's still true now that, a lot of young flute players are being encouraged to to learn all the concerto repertoire. Of course you should. But, you know, in the real world, how are they going to live? How are they going to survive on that? Yep. And wonderful to be able to do and really important as part of your education and great accomplishment. The real skill is learning how to play the flute in the middle of this pool of strange noises that you're supposed to try and blend with and make a beautiful noise and sometimes distorting everything you do in order to do that. That's what's beautiful and horrendous about playing in an orchestra. You know, it's such a, an uphill battle and an effort, but it's so rewarding. You know, I just loved what she said about the wooden flute sound and using your vowels and not trying to sound like a flute. I, th- I was warming up backstage a, year, like a long time ago, which makes me think I was warming up doing my, you know, triple Y tone and my Moyes adapted backstage before the rehearsal. And somebody said to me, they came around the corner and said, oh my God, I thought you were a clarinet. And I was like, oh, thank you. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I was doing the ooey, you know, the hollow, the hollow part of it. And I was so delighted with that because that's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? You want to just try and sound like, be able to try and sound like an oboe, try and sound like a clarinet, try and sound like a, a violin. And of course it's impossible, but you you can nearly get there, can't you? And that's, to me, that's still my last day in the orchestra that will be what keeps me going, what makes me tick, is trying to blend all the time. Tuning is a, oh, let's not even go there. It's just the possibilities are infinite. Everything Atara was saying about that, I just couldn't agree with more. So thanks for doing the podcast with her. I know it was Claire, but thanks, Claire. <laughs> yeah, so it was you, brilliant. So you've brought us a, a wonderful area called blending. Now, blending for me is... That is when you can listen to some music and there's more obviously more than one person playing. And in essence, you're just hearing one sort of something in the round when where there isn't these alternative vibrations that are distorting one instrument from another. You are yeah. just hearing this whole sound. And I know generally we listen to orchestral music in the round and we only focus occasionally when we hear a solo. And the joy is sometimes is sitting into an orchestral concert and just say to yourself, I'm now just going to aim to listen to the cellos or I'm now just going to listen to the basses and only focus on that because that's really really interesting when you're just focusing on different parts but blending blending is probably I know I've never played an orchestra like yours but blending for me if I was sat with you would be the most complicated thing that you could do as a flute player because you are playing with everybody at very various different times no it is difficult and I've, I've sat down the line in sections you know I'm, I haven't always been the principal so I think I appreciate that difficulty and it does give me a greater understanding of it has to be reciprocal you, you can't just be too principal flutey about it all the time and this is the way I play and you must you must blend with me you know that's not ideal either you need a bit of give and take especially when it's with other instruments, but even within your own section. I think maybe that's an unusual attitude to have as a first flute player, but if it's going to get the best result, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, it's, it's even in the way we attack, isn't it? Like, so we have, the, even in the woodwinds, you know, we have an oboe attack. Like, you know, I know my lovely colleague, Matthew Manning, on, on first oboe beside me. He's a total sweetheart. I know how he plays and I know I can tell from the way he does that, that how he's going to attack the note and you just and I also know sometimes he's going to wait a tiny bit and just do that and I can see it but maybe my colleague beside me can't so I'll just say just hang back a second I'm waiting for Matthew here you know that kind of thing but I love that I love those tiny details that you the conductor's not asking to do it the music's not asking to do it but that's for me what playing in an orchestra is about you know and the woodwinds in the NSO have a lovely rapport and it's a really nice team. We're not completely full. We we will need a second bassoon. And our principal clarinet, our second clarinet's been sitting up for the principal for a while. So I'm not sure that job might be advertised soon. That would be. So we're down two people. but So we've got lots of lovely freelancers coming in. But we're a really solid team. And it's lovely. And we're all going for a meal next week. So <laughs> it's just nice. You know, it is really nice. You have colleague relationships. Yeah. But in the same blending context, you actually have note relationships. So as you're playing a piece, the relationship, as you've just pointed out, is notational as well because you've got to have a relationship with what you're going to do with yeah. the player in the section or even, God forbid, further down in the scratchy things in front of you. Isn't it brilliant? I just love it. I just love every minute of it. I do. I just love these challenges. And yeah, it's fabulous. You know, but then we have distraction and inconvenience of a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think like in an ideal world, an orchestra should be like large scale chamber music, shouldn't it? But it's, yeah. it's just, we're, we're, it's too big and too unwieldy to sometimes manage them. That's why we need conductors. And I know they're more than that. But, but yeah, but sometimes they can make life a little bit more difficult. And who, who's, <laughs> you know? who's the mischievous section, is it? Are we going back to the trombones? Because they seem to be the mi most mischievous in most orchestras. They're, they're not there enough to be mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're there. They're they're always they're mischievous in every orchestra. I think our viola section is a bit, yeah, really? a lot of wild cards. It always has been in our orchestra. We've had some strong personalities there who just like chat directly with the conductor, you know, <laughs> 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 which is quite funny. I'm not sure what's the most mischievous. Probably violas at the moment, yeah. But I, I'm sure that's going to change in a few years. Do you, if, if we go back to your own experience of becoming the, the principal flute what were the, some of the key moments or experiences that shaped your career to date because you're still relatively young so what has oh, it thanks. been and this is video as well thank you 
<laughs> um, what has shaped it? I think I'm I'm a bit too unconventional to answer that question. If it's if it's a question that anyone was hoping to get advice from, because you know when I was young, in every way as a flute player, young and naive and uh, idealistic, I think I thought my perfect job would be first flute in a chamber orchestra, a small orchestra, you know, and a little bit more experience. Um, I thought, oh, I'd love to play in a ballet orchestra, an opera orchestra, you know, in a pit. It's not as nerve wracking. You're not as on on stage because I do get a bit nervous sometimes, less so over the years. And with a few life experiences that give you perspective, you get less nervous for sure. But no, I subsequently realized ballet is a nightmare if you don't stop playing. It's just you play, 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 absolute nightmare. Opera, you're so unimportant. It could be a little frustrating, but depends what else you do in between the opera runs. It's also you have to play incredibly quietly a lot of the time, which is fine. I, I like playing quietly, but it'd be nice to have a bit more balance. But I do love opera. I do love opera. I think I would love that job, be perfectly honest. I think I would adore it. But yeah, I realized Chamber Orchestra afterwards... Maybe it's a bit too small, you know, on a constant basis. You are very exposed. Sort of ended up falling into the job I have with a couple, by default, in a way. When I went to college, I suddenly got piccolo lessons, which I'd never had, with Pat Morris. And I realised I could actually play it, because I always thought I just couldn't play it. Because my, my teacher had this gorgeous little rudel cart um, with the silver inlay in the wood for the lip plate. I mean, beautiful. Couldn't play it for my life. Could not play it couldn't play it it was awful and um just thought oh that's that I'm not a piccolo player went to college had to learn piccolo and had a really great teacher and suddenly realized wow this is fun I like this this is actually great and then the job that ended coming up in Ireland around the time I was finishing up my undergrad was a piccolo job and I was lucky enough to get it very happy in that job but it just happened by default because uh, our mutual friend Bill took a year off and the second flute player at the time didn't want to sit up. And that's how that happened, they asked me. And I said, well, ooh, I don't know. And then uh, I thought, well, this is a challenge. You know, I should do it. And I did. But it wasn't like I was ambitious and aiming for it, which is probably a deeply unpopular thing for to admit to younger people. They would be like, why wouldn't you be ambitious? Why wouldn't you be going for a first flute job all the time? But, you know, if you love playing in an orchestra, you know that the first flute player isn't always the most important thing. You know, it's... In a good orchestra, in a good performance, there's almost no hierarchy except the music, you know? So you have to have the mentality that you don't mind not being important, you know? So I've never minded not being the sole focus of a performance or a piece of music or an ensemble. I've never minded that. And maybe that's good advice for a young person listening to try and get as much experience in every part or anything they're offered that they don't necessarily only go looking for first flute. I mean, it depends on your personality. I, I wouldn't be... I'd be maybe an exception in that regard. So it's a little bit, I fell into it. <laughs> I, fell, I fell into my first few job, yeah. Are there ever occasions when you're, you're playing or the orchestra's playing and the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? Oh, God, of course. You know, yeah. there's something actually magical happens. And that is largely, when we, 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 the conductors are sort of there on this sort of plinth over there and you've got the orchestra that's making these sort of experiences happen. But how often, bearing in mind you've played a hell of a lot of repertoire over and over again, how often does that little magic point happen? Isn't it funny? Because this comes back to what you mentioned earlier about how no two performances are the same. Hmm. So you could play rack pag, as we'd call it. You yeah. could play that, you know, five times and you might only get those goosebumps once. It's not necessarily just the music. It's the moment, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and it's also, I think, you can feel when everyone's in that moment, when everyone's really giving. And that's when those goosebumps happen. And, and it, it's great that they still do. You don't get immune to them and you you know it's a really it's a really special moment to have been in, you know, to been involved in. And, be, and it's partly because you're contributing something to it as well. I mean, I know the audience feels it, but being part of it is completely magical, isn't it? I think yeah. creating something that not only can make an emotional connection with yourself at that moment in time, because once that's happened, it's gone, it'll never come back again because it was that moment but also to others. I mean, to be able to affect the emotion, emotional response of thousands of people by blowing into something. <laughs> it's completely mental, isn't it? I know, I sometimes say to people, I blow into a tube for a living. What the hell is wrong with me? But, um, but you know, it's true. What you said at the beginning of that is that you, you get you get that lovely, I keep saying goosebumps. I'm trying to think of another way of expressing it, but that lovely, amazing, exhilarating feeling but you don't get that in rehearsal, do you? And it's because the audience is there 
it's because it's because you're you're sharing it with them and you can see that they're you can feel that they're feeling it I think it's that I think I don't know what the word for that is but you can feel that they're experiencing that too you know that's what makes the difference it's just gorgeous and yeah. isn't that the joy of just being a musician is that not only are you a creator you're also a, you're a narrator because you're narrating a story that has been written down by a composer. And you're also a guide because you're guiding the, the audience through this narrative that the conductor is actually yeah. heading that. And you're not speaking, but you're speaking through a different pitch, a different style. You're not sort of, yeah. you're not saying this beautiful poem that is really going to draw emotional content and emotional reaction. Yeah. You're blowing through a sideways blowing tube. That's mental, and isn't it? It is. <laughs> and how you change your jaw, your vowels, will predetermine the sound that will come out. And if you just had a different vowel sound or different shape in your throat or your mouth, the same goose pumps wouldn't be there. Might not happen. No. I know. The pressure. Oh, my God, the pressure now. But, yeah. No, you're just a conduit, aren't you? Is that the word? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're in, 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 like you can bring things to another realm. Almost. It's like a, another plane of existence for everyone. And I don't mean me personally. I mean, I mean the music. I mean the orchestra. I mean the, the collaborative effort. It's just, it's such a privilege to get to do that, isn't it? And, and, that, and that's why we all do it, those moments. And it's not like they're every week. And I, I actually mm. think it's much better that they're not every week, you know, because then you really appreciate them when you feel them. Basically, musicians are so self-driven. We're, we're self-motivated. We have to be. But it's, you know, you have your peaks and troughs. For sure. I'm not in a massive peak at the moment, for example. I'm, I'm sort of struggling to make myself practice and work. And those little moments keep you sane. They keep you motivated and they keep you on your toes. I heard somebody being interviewed about being a first two player and they were saying, I, I could have been for you. I'm not sure who it was actually. It was, um, and he was saying that when his when he got his principal flute job, his, his teacher said to him, oh, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to stop running now. You're basically running a marathon and you have to keep running it, you know. And there's an element of, but it's a very extreme way of looking at it, but there's an element of truth to it. It doesn't stop. You know, you're, there's music flying past your face all the time. You have to be of a certain standard all the time. And yet you're human. And the more human you are, the better you are at your job in a way, because you're what we're talking about. You're able to then freely emote or whatever. Um, but yeah, it can be tricky. It's hard to be on 100% all the time and not have it impact on you in some way. So, yeah, having these lovely moments, really just reminding you of why you got into this business. You know, it's not that like things are grim or anything, but at the same time, it always lifts you again. And you're like, and you're you're almost just like you're 11 years old again. It's like you get to be who you were when you started the instrument and you're just like, wow, this is such a fabulous, shiny thing. I just, oh my God, life is amazing, you know? And all those moments bring you right back there, but she's still in there, you know, it's great. So yeah, I for one wouldn't do anything else with my life. And you mentioned there the word practice. Yeah. Now, anyone, everybody that listens to this podcast, I think you're probably musicians, so you understand what the word practice is. But those outside this this little comfort blanket that we have amongst ourselves as classical musicians <laughs> don't really realise that you are studying from day one, which could be at six years old, until the day you end up stop playing, which is probably the day that you breathe your last breath. You are studying every single day. So you may have a performance, but you're still practising. How many other jobs do you you have to study every single day. I know it's such that's the only thing about our job. I mean, I'm one of those people if I stop playing, if I don't practice for it, say <laughs> if I took a weekend off, I am um, it's a train wreck on Monday, you know. <laughs> I can't take too much time off playing at all. And when I do, it has to be a two week window or something where I know I have a week to recover and get things back up again. So I mean, some, I'm, I'm, some people are like Jaime, for example, hasn't played for years and he'll pick his food up and he'll be fine, which is really annoying. But yeah, I, you have to incorporate practice in. And that's the one thing about our job. I sometimes think it would be so nice to be able to shut the office door and get a, you know, walk home or whatever and, and just be. But, um, but long note practices, you know, there isn't a day where you don't have to do that stuff. You don't have to sort yeah. of get your throat, get everything in shape, get yourself attuned with the vibrations of your instrument. And you're yeah. exactly right. You can go in, done all the practice, you've, you've warmed up and you just have this gut feeling things aren't great. You put the flute <laughs> up and you know straight away. Exactly, exactly. And you just have to go with those days. You, you learn that over the years, don't you? You just go with them. You, and in a performance, say if you're lucky enough to be doing a solo in front of the orchestra, 
you had the last one I did, I was really feeling that way. I was really like, I started to play that morning. Oh no, it's not a great day. You know, it's just an okay day. And I wanted it to be a great day. And you just go with what you're given on the night. It's usually an evening, isn't it? But I remember saying that to Jim, Jimmy was playing with us and he was backstage before the concert, you know, and I was saying, um, he was just chatting away, you know, and, and I was saying, do you not get nervous? And he said, what's the point? <laughs> he said, what's the point? I said, you know, you know, I've done the work. I'll, I'll go out there. What will, what will be, will be. There's nothing I can do about it now. So just go and do it. So, I mean, I try to, I try to emulate that. I find it a little bit more difficult than he does, but his work ethos is really um, inspiring, isn't it? It's yeah. still inspiring. Yeah. But he's got, he's got all those natural skills, but God, that he still works so hard. I love that. And I don't have a time to work as hard as I'd like to, you know, with after works for rehearsals and teaching and things. I would love to be able to work as hard as he does. <laughs> But you do have to keep it up. You do have to incorporate it in. And even psychologically, you have to be sort of practicing, you know, like your how your your outlook. So you never can really stop until you have a significant break of some kind, I think. But you just, you know that. Every musician knows that, I think. Every musician knows it. But the people that try and book you for free because they say it'd be good for your good for your profile, they just don't understand. They, they've got no idea. They've got no idea. It is hard to, you just sound offensive, don't you? When you try to explain it to a non-musician. We know we have to practice. If you just sound offensive and they, there's no point trying to convince those people. <laughs> They're going to think what they think. There's nothing I, we can do about it. I had a joke with my plumber. I did plumber come the other day to fit some new taps on the bath. I, I actually, know, I know the owner of the plumbing people. So um, it, we, we, set, we, we set, him, set him up. So he came round, he did the taps and he said i'll i'll just write the invoice out of you said oh no no don't worry it'd be good for your profile i'll stick you i'll stick your name up on instagram and he was his, his eyes were no no and i said that is how <laughs> musicians sometimes treat it treated. Yeah. yeah give your services yeah. for free even though they've been they could have been studying for 20 years yeah it's crazy isn't it i love it when people flip that round you sometimes see that on social media don't you where somebody's gotten a letter from something like a restaurant or something and then they flip it around and they send them back saying if you come to my house and you make a meal to feed 25 of my friends <laughs> and, and then you know we, we will we will post it on social media and you'll get great notoriety out of it. and it's, it's like that seems so ridiculous and yes the other doesn't you know it's not fair that's another whole podcast oh isn't it just <laughs> so the life the life of a musician especially a musician where the perception for a lot of the world is when you're irish you're born with a flute play, the flute anyway because there there is just something beautiful about the flute and the an irish music within the flute as an instrument there's something magic happens whether it's traditional irish flute or whether it is i'd actually say an irish person playing irish music because there is this depth of soul there's this depth of feeling that unless you're irish it's really hard to get it i mean i once played the pastoral hongrails in hungary at the list academy so many years ago i thought it went really well but it was disastrous okay and, and i learned on that day don't play something as in, that's important to the culture and the yes. uh, and the musical culture unless you belong to that unless you know it back to front and you almost belong to that culture yeah it's true like if you've grown up hearing a certain lilt in in, in irish yeah. folk music you know how it goes i mean i would feel because there are such amazing traditional irish flute players around I would feel a little bit self-conscious about playing an Irish jig, but they're so fabulous. The tr trad players here are just incredible, you know. Um, but if you had an Irish composer who'd written this beautiful theme and give, gave you the narrative of a certain part in Ireland that you know, when you're performing that, everything yeah, is, everything so is aligned. I'm just thinking of it. You've just reminded me, we just played... A, there's an Irish composer called Shorsha Bodley, which is Irish for George, Shorsha. And we played, he's, he's in his 80-ish, you know, he's, he's that age. Um, we've played it before and we were doing a, a concert of Irish composers and his was in the piece. We've played it before, but it's got this beautiful little, it's called A Small Cloud Drifts Over Ireland and A Small White Cloud, I think, actually. There's this gorgeous, suddenly in the middle of it, this gorgeous, just everyone goes, um, and the flute has this beautiful, almost improvised solo and I adore playing it it's just gorgeous and it's exactly what you're talking about it makes me feel like it's the, I'm drying my roots are underneath me and you know be god now it, there's such strength in it but it's really beautiful and haunting and simple simple and right down the bottom of the flute you know lovely oh. when you're on your own in the orchestra it's gorgeous to get to play that register because you, you don't have to push you know you, you don't have to project you just play and those moments I really appreciate in the orchestra because they don't happen very often you know because they, it's such a big beast and um, where we are situation in the middle 
you have to project. So if we play with the most gentle pianissimo in the low register, it just won't be heard. And also you have to match your colleagues. So sometimes there's a, you add a certain strength to the low register, but that is really beautiful solo. So I'm not sure if it's recorded. I think we might have recorded it donkeys years ago. So probably Bill Dowdle playing the solo if you, if you do find it somewhere. <laughs> but um, I don't think, maybe I did record it. I can't remember. I do love it. Yeah, that's a lovely Irish moment. Like Irish slash orchestra moment for me. Absolutely, completely what you're talking about. It's, it's like the definition of it. Yeah. There is, there is something magical about Ireland, not only the people, the culture, the history, but also the humour. 32% Irish. That's good. I'm now 30, <laughs> I found myself 32% Irish. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but there's, there's always been something that is so attractive. I can see why people in America want to be Irish because you have such a fun time. And as you said earlier, orchestral sections don't normally gel well enough to go out for dinner. All of yeah, them. You know, yeah, there's, yeah. There's always somebody that is rocking the boat or someone that is of different type of personality. But there's this thing with it's my perceptions, obviously, I'm not Irish, but you go to Ireland and you have a good time. You know, life is it's about work, yes, it's about earning the crust, but it's also about living. Yeah, there's a humanity to it. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think um, sometimes people in orchestras can forget. You can be very doggy dog and um, yeah. you can be aiming to achieve the highest possible standards in your playing as, a, as an orchestra and as an ensemble and still respect and like each other and have fun and get a balance, you know, try and get a good balance going. Yeah, we're very fortunate in our woodwind section and do appreciate it. <laughs> how, how, many of your, how many of your section are actually Irish? That's a really good question. The, the flute section were all Irish, actually. That's not surprising. All, Irish, all female. The oboes actually, our principal oboe is English, but he has been here so long, he's effectively Irish and he's married to an Irish lady. Um, our second oboe is French, so not Irish, but also married to an Irish lady in here quite a long time now. And our Kronglet player is English. Debbie went to Jets. Um, uh, okay, bassoon, Greg, Irish, recent appointee. No second bassoon at the moment. Um, country bassoon, third bassoon, Irish. Our principal clarinet is officially vacant, but the Matt, who plays, is officially second, but he plays principal really excellently well all the time, is English. We'll forgive him. I'm only kidding, and we've still accepted him. No, we're joking. Um, <laughs> and Finton, our bass clarinet, is very decidedly Irish. <laughs> He's just completely fantastic character. He's incredibly laid back. He's he's a little bit naughty. He gets away with absolute murder. On these meals, we have to be very careful. Uh, he knows he knows he wouldn't mind me saying that. And um, yeah, it's just it's a really nice chemistry going on. I think it works. Just talking to you without a schedule. It just it just it just works. We haven't even spoken about what the perfect cup of tea is or that your love of cats. We haven't even gone to it and we've come to the end because we've been going over an hour and we've just I know, I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> I was worried about what I talk about and now I've stopped talking. But anyway. Now, I, what's interesting is I had, I've got some questions that were sent in by people and we haven't even covered them, which means we will have to do another one. Well, you can do them if you like and stick them in if you want. I don't mind. I, I'd you. like to do another one because I want to talk about your cats, but also this perfect cup of tea, <laughs> which I've tried to do. I've got this machine that does times, but it doesn't yeah. work. I say I'm a coffee boy, but I've tried to do tea at different temperatures and at different lengths and I can't perfect it. So I think that's a separate. I'm hardly, hardly the actual expert but and my kettle my wonderful kettle that has all these different temperatures is, is dying it just it just keeps boiling it doesn't turn itself off and uh you have to twist it right yeah so i'm gonna have to invest in a new one <laughs> maybe i'll just have to turn to bog standard you know pg tips <laughs> <laughs> oh could you imagine <laughs> no it's, it's like no. it's like me going to nescafe or something it's uh, <laughs> oh, oh. no no creme <laughs> oh. oh you've been so generous with your time and you're always oh, like so, so lovely to talk to thank you for having me I'm surprised I, d I hadn't invited you back before because it was such a it, it, the first podcast we did we did with you was so really well well received by others and the analytics were really quite high but it's been downloaded 28,361 times and in the first week downloaded four and a half thousand times wow yeah that's oh my god can i listen back to what i said today <laughs> that's that's terrifying <laughs> i mean as a musician i don't think i'd ever be heard by that many people you know what i mean yeah and that's, that's crazy. and that's what i've been saying to the podcast people is can you please stop listening because if you stop <laughs> listening i can actually stop doing these 
<laughs> Six years, 265 podcasts. Claire and I want to stop, but we can't because we're reaching lots of people. And as, as soon as the analytics, I've got this metric. As soon as it goes under, I'll go, oh, I can retire. Oh, <laughs> well, let me, let me do one on you and then that will be one down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that's a deal. I we we will arrange a date in the future when you're you've got a free Thank space. You. You've got a free space, and I will just shut up and let you speak to me. How about that? It's a oh, deal. I think people would really like to hear about you talk about yourself. <laughs> I mean, I know you do, but like, what do you think? I think they would. There is no there. You can say anything. You can ask me anything. Because I'm a, a literally open book, I don't really have a filter. Those that know me know that I'm a giggler and I've got myself into trouble in in my musical past through giggling and not being able to stop giggling. So uh, it, I, you can ask me anything and what comes out comes out. That's why you're so good at it because, you know, I end up saying things I would probably never say normally. Uh, <laughs> and then you tell me 28,000 people will hear it. That's just <laughs> great. <laughs> And if you oh, well. if you ask me why I wear always I've only ever worn red socks since I was sixteen, I will tell you the story. Yeah, I think we should definitely do that. If people don't know that already, no, I don't. I, I only tell people when they say you've got red socks on again. Why is that? I think it's time to turn the tables, John Paul. <laughs> Definitely. You've been wonderful today. <laughs> oh, absolutely wonderful. And I'm so sorry I've taken so much of your time. Not at all. I'm, I have a free, rare free afternoon. So thank you. How's your, we- <laughs> how's your weather doing? Because you normally fling it this it's way. All, it was so beautiful this morning, but now it's all cloudy. It's all clouded over. Because yeah, uh, what starts over yours ends up being thrown our way anyway, doesn't it? True. I mean, when I got up this morning, it was due to be sunny all day and it's... Well, apparently it's still sunny on day. Well, they're lying because it's completely cloud cover. Yeah. It must be be really hard to be a weather person in Ireland just because, just because where you're located and all the airstreams. Anything could happen. I know. (laughs) It could go anyway. Yeah. It's a downside of living in Ireland. I think the weather's never, like we had a terrific weekend. It was completely beautiful. And uh, I was off and we were doing stuff in the garden and it was just beautiful. But like you really, really appreciate it when that happens started because it doesn't happen very often. Probably pretty much similar in the UK, right? I mean, yeah. fairly similar. Well, normally yeah. where I live, just outside London, the weather's in this time of year is lovely. And up north, it's always sort of raining and, and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and dull. But I know, it, I- they flipped it. <laughs> They've got all the good weather and we've just got oh. sort of cloud and it's sunny now, but just cloud and sort of yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I lived in Manchester for four years. I know. It makes everything so much more difficult, doesn't it, it when it's does. raining? And if anyone's yeah. ever seen a Lowry pa- uh, painting, that is <laughs> Manchester, isn't it? Yeah. Was that you talking about bringing your son? Oh, yeah, to the Lowry Gallery. <laughs> The dog, yeah, that was you. <laughs> he said that. He's he talk about it sometimes. Yeah, he said from another. He's, uh, he wandered in. He's only young. Wandered into the other room and said, uh, "All I heard was, Dad, this is rubbish. I could do this. It's made of sticks or drawn of sticks." <laughs> Yeah, I, I took my, my husband to, we were in Nice, so we went up to the Matisse Museum, right. that was it. And we were walking around, and he was getting grumpier and grumpier. He was like, I could do this, it's ridiculous. Who <laughs> <laughs> thought I could do these paintings? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I think I've converted it. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for your time. And oh, I promise you. you, I will let you turn the... Interview you. Turn the <laughs> I'm excited already. Yeah, and the great thing is you won't tell me what the subject matter is and that would be yeah. even funnier. That would be... Completely reverse the tables, exactly what you did to me. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you things of when I weed myself on the radio and lots... Oh, no, let's not do that. <laughs> well, I was, just so, I was so scared at the time when the red light went on. <gasps> And the trombone player behind and said in, in rehearsals, just said, don't forget when the red light goes on, it says on, on air, you know, you're live to a couple of million people. And, I, and it didn't process until I was stood there ready to play and um, the red light went on and all I could hear was that trombone player. Oh, that's a terrible thing to do to you. Yeah, it wasn't a proper wee. It was just sort of a, a little nervous yeah. thing. <laughs> information <laughs> don't worry i'm gonna cut that bit out so <laughs> <laughs> good catriona thank you so much for joining us on talking flutes this week may your week ahead just be musically fulfilling as always you're always smiling so i, I don't even need to tell you to keep smiling because that seems to be a permanent fixture on your face only when i do <laughs> 
<laughs> and you can follow Catriona on Instagram at Catriona Flute. So C A T R I O N A Flute on Instagram and Cat Ryan on Facebook. So, so follow her. She is wonderful. And you, you normally get an up to date examples of what she's actually doing. And she posts lots of links and things. It's really, really, really good. Peaks and troughs, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Peaks and troughs. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for listening this week. And may your week be musically fulfilling and may your high C sharp be especially smooth and delicate and quiet because mine never is bye-bye everybody bye <laughs> bye and I've, I've, i'm gonna say slornlet oh good slornlet slornlet is that is that okay my gaelic yeah a slornlet if it was plural but slornlet is to an individual yeah Hey, hey, we end this podcast, <laughs> chaps, on an Irish lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.